Lopez, who comes from Maceió, which is a beautiful little town in northeast of Brazil, a little south of Recife. Fernando came to uh, Impa. Um, I should mention that from Maceió, there are several mathematicians that we know. Hilario Alencar, who is presently there, uh, Ellen Lima from Maceió, and uh, Manfredo do Carmo as well. So Hilario suggested to uh, Fernando that he come to Impa at 18 years old. This is 1997. And he came and did his master's degree in three years, from 97 to the year 2000. As a teacher at Impa, I had the opportunity to go into the computer and look at his grades. And in those three years, he took 20 classes. And uh, in seven of the classes, he had a grade that was slightly lower than the other 13 classes. In those seven, oh, and the grading system in IMPA is A, B, C, D, F, and incomplete. So in the seven classes that he got a lower grade, that was an A. In the other 13 classes, it was A plus. So Fernando left IMPA at, uh, in the year 2000 to go do his PhD in Cornell. And he, he finished there in 2003. In the nine years, approximately, that he's uh, finished his PhD, his work, the first four years, I would say, was greatly influenced by the ideas of Rick Shane and the work of Rick Shane. I guess this was uh, a consequence of the fact that his advisor in Cornell was uh, Chepi Escobar, who was a student of Rick. In any case, uh, after his thesis, he came to work at IMPA from 2000, uh, until 2000 and 2003 until 2005, at which time he went to do a postdoc in uh, Stanford with uh, Rick. And he worked on a, a conjecture of Rick concerning uh, the compactness of uh, metrics of constant scalar curvature on a compact manifold other than the n-sphere of volume one in a given conformal class. So in this uh, problem, uh, in collaboration with Rick and Curley, uh, they managed to prove that uh, one has compactness in dimensions less than 25. And Rick uh, told me yesterday that indeed it was Fernando was the major influence in managing to prove this. Simon Brendel consequently found counterexamples in dimensions greater than or equal to 51. And then to finish this problem completely, Simon Brendel and Fernando found counterexamples between 25 and 51. So that problem's completely <laughs> solved. After this, in 2006, uh, Fernando met Andre Nevis in Princeton, and they became friends and uh, very strong collaborators. They worked uh, initially on problems related to what's called the uh, Min O conjecture. And uh, Fernando and Andre and uh, Simon Brendel managed to find a counterexample to this conjecture. The conjecture says that on a hemisphere of the n-sphere, with the of the n-sphere, if you have a metric that's the standard metric in the neighborhood of the equator, then its scalar curvature cannot be greater than or equal to the scalar curvature of the n-sphere without being exactly equal to the metric of the n-sphere. So they found a counterexample to this. And subsequently, uh, Fernando worked with Andre Nevis on problems related to rigidity of minimal surfaces in uh, manifolds. And they began to look at minimax techniques in this connection. Then Perlman came and uh, revolutionized the geometry for us with his solution to the Poincare conjecture. And uh, Fernando managed, uh, this now is by himself, to uh, study the proof of Perlman, understand the singularities in the Ricci flow and the surgeries that one does to solve again the question that was originally posed by Rick uh, years ago as to whether the space of metrics of positive scalar curvature on the three sphere is a connected space. So Fernando managed to prove this in a really brilliant paper by really analyzing the singularities that occur in the Ricci flow that Perlman analyzed and going much further to managed to prove that, indeed, he could bypass these singularities. And he proved a more general theorem that in any three-manifold, compact three-manifold, 
that admits a metric of positive scalar curvature, the space in question is connected. Well, then a few months ago, the mathematical community, the geometers at least, that, uh, that I know, were astounded to see that Fernando and Andre Neves came out with a solution to perhaps the first global problem in conformal geometry that was been around for 50 years that you see stated up there. This problem has, attacked the, uh, has attracted the attention of uh, many mathematicians and has produced much really good mathematics in the last 50 years. That shows how it's a good problem. For example, Robert Bryan worked on this quite a, quite a lot and produced a beautiful theory of spheres, Wilmore spheres in three manifolds. Uh, Li and Yao did many developments in conformal geometry. Leon Simon proved the existence of minimizers to the functional in question. People in integral systems like Bobenko, uh, Pinkel, uh, et cetera, et cetera, developed a great deal of mathematics to attack this problem. So today, Fernando is going to present to us his solution with Andre Neves of this problem. Okay, thank you, Hera, for your generous words. Uh, so I have to say that I uh, remember very vividly the first time I entered IMPA. I was 17 years old, not 18. <laughs> so that was in 97. I was coming from Maceió in the Northeast. I was just a young kid. I had heard about IMPA. So um, I had been accepted in the, su the summer program of IMPA. So I remember uh, very well that I was amazed the minute I entered here. So it was the first time I saw so many uh, different people uh, from different regions and different countries all talking about mathematics. So that was quite, a, quite an experience uh, to me. I'm sure that the young kids of today also get the same kind of feeling when, I, when, when they arrive here for the, for the first time. So after all those years, 16 years, for me, it, it's quite an honor to have the opportunity to speak here uh, in this special occasion. So thank you to the organizers for the, for the invitation. Um, and as Harold said, um, today I'm going to talk about, sorry, so today I'm going to talk about a, a problem in, in classical differential geometry, which was uh, left open since the mid, mid 60s, namely uh, the Wilmer conjecture, and about uh, uh, the proof that we gave together with Andre Nevis, who's a professor in Imperial College, UK, which is based on the theory of minimal surfaces. So the, so, so the problem is classical because it's a question about surfaces in three space, which is ideal for this kind of conference because everybody will be able to understand the, the statements and have some ideas of, of the proofs also. So, so we, we solved the problem using the so-called MIMAX theory of minimal surfaces, which had been established in the early 80s. So my goal today is to motivate the problem first, uh, say a few words about its history, and then I'll, I'll try to explain the main ideas in the proof. All right, so, so I usually give a blackboard talk, but today I, I wanna show some pictures so maybe I'll, I'll use both. Okay, so, right. So let me start with a, with a vague question. So suppose that you have, uh, you fix a surface of genus G, an, an abstract surface, right? So the genus is zero. You're talking about the sphere. Uh, genus one, your surface is a torus, and so on. So you fix one of those topological types, and then you ask the following question. So what is the best realization of such a surface into Euclidean three space. So of course there are many, many different shapes a given surface can assume in Euclidean three space, but somehow you want to find the best one in some uh, precise and interesting mathematical sense. So of course if you ask this question for, for the topological sphere, it's natural uh, to think about round spheres are uh, the solutions, right? The, those are the most uh, symmetric surfaces one can think of. Uh, but if you ask the question, what is the best torus in R3, then, then, then the answer is not so clear. So you have to make it more precise. So you're going to make it precise by, 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 by using differential geometry. So recall that given a surface into Euclidean three space, uh, the geometry, the local geometry is described by these two numbers called the principal curvatures. 
uh, at a given point P, which are obtained in a very uh, simple way. So what you do is that you choose a perpendicular direction to your surface passing through that point. You look at planes uh, containing that direction and passing through that point. So those planes, those planes cut, cut the surface, of course, in the planar curve. So you have a curvature associated to that particular plane. And then as you vary your plane, you see different, different curvatures those, of those curves. You take the, the maximum and the minimum curvature. So those are called the, the principal curvatures, which are very important numbers in geometry. Uh, so out, out of these two numbers, so they're always achieved in orthogonal directions. Out of these two numbers, you can define uh, the two classical definitions of curvature in differential geometry. You can take, for example, the average of those two numbers, and that's called the mean curvature. And you can also consider the product, and that's, that's the Gauss curvature. So if you integrate the, the Gauss curvature, then the Gauss-Bonnet theorem tells us that the result is a topological number. You get 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of a closed surface, let's say. So uh, I want to find, for example, the best torus. So one way uh, to think about that question is to try to formulate some interesting variational problem and, and try to find um, the surface that minimizes uh, some interesting quantity. So if you want your problem to be uh, scale invariant, right, it's natural to integrate expressions which are uh, quadratic in the principal curvatures. Of course, if you integrate the Gauss curvature, you get basically nothing right, out, of, out of that question because it's always the same number for a given topological type. But you can integrate instead the square of the mean curvature. That, so, so that's called the Wilmore energy of a surface in R3. So let me just write down the definition here. So we're talking about surfaces in three space. closed surface, maybe with some genus, then the Wilmore energy of sigma is just the integral of the mean curvature square. So that's the, the simplest uh, geometric uh, scale invariant quantity that one can, one can look at. So it turns out that this number is also invariant under conformal transformations. So it's very easy to see that it's invariant under rotations and translations. Also, as I said, scalings. But it's also invariant under inversions. And this fact was known uh, back in the 1920s uh, to Blaschke and, and, and Thompson, those people working in conformal geometry. And it also appears in some physical situations. Uh, so it goes back as uh, in 1812. I guess Poisson proposed that number uh, as a measure of the elastic energy of some uh, given membrane in three space. So you can think about the Wilmer energy as the elastic energy of your surface, for example. And it also appears in the so-called Helfrich model in mathematical biology to model uh, cell membranes. Uh, right. So then you ask the question, OK, so, so we have this quantity, and then uh, the subject was, so as I said, uh, Blaschke already knew about the conformal invariance, but the subject was reinitiated by Wilmer in the 1960s, who managed to prove that the Wilmer energy of any given closed surface, no matter its genus, is always bounded below by 4 pi, which turns out to be precisely uh, the Wilmer energy of a round sphere. Right? So this is compatible with this idea that, uh, that the round sphere should be the best sphere in Euclidean three space. And if you have equality, you have to be the round sphere. So he also proved the rigidity. Then in 1965, he, he posed the question, so what is the best, uh, what is the minimizer for, for, for genus one? So if a surface is a torus, he made a conjecture, so that's called the Wilmer conjecture. So he conjectured that the Wilmer energy, in other words, the integral of the square of the mean curvature of any torus immersed in R3, should be at least 2 pi square. So that was his, his prediction. All right. And in order to uh, get to this number, what he did was the following. So he considered a circular tori. So you, you, you pick a, a circle in the plane. And then you can uh, suppose, so the plane x, y, for example. Then you can rotate such circle around the y axis. This generates a surface of revolution, which is called a circular torus. And he managed to prove that among all such pos possible 
surfaces of revolution, surf circular tori, the best one was that, that torus. So you have to choose the ratio right. So the distance from the center to the axis should be, for example, if, if it's square root of 2, the radius of the circle has to be 1. Uh, so that was the best among the circular torus. So here is a picture. And its real more energy is, is 2 pi square. Right? So that's, he predicted that this was the, the minimizer. So you can ask the question, uh, why 2 pi square, right? So is there a deep reason uh, this number shows up? The answer is, is yes. It's related to the theory of minimal surfaces. Uh, so this was, was known, known before, of course. So what you do is that you take this stereographic projection from the 3 sphere to R3 minus a point, S3 minus a point. So that's a conformal transformation. And then if you start with a surface in the 3 sphere instead, you can take its projection uh, into Euclidean space, and then you can, you can compute its, its Wilmer energy. So let's say sigma tilde is the projection of your surface. It's very easy to, uh, to compute that the Wilmer energy of the projection now is going to be the integral of 1 plus the mean curvature squared of the original surface. So now the mean curvature uh, is computed with respect to the spherical geometry. So it's a different point of view instead of uh, thinking of surfaces in R3, you can, you can think of a surface in S3 instead, right? Some surface here. And then the Wilmer energy is just the integral of 1 plus mean curvature squared. So those problems are completely equivalent, the problem of minimizing the Wilmer energy. You can either think about surfaces in three space or surfaces in the three sphere. So that's the definition. So this is the point of view that I will adopt in this talk. So for, uh, I'll, I'll talk about surfaces in the three sphere instead, and the Wilmore energy is just given by this number. So you can see easily that if your surface inside the three sphere is a minimal surface, in other words, if the mean curvature is zero, we know lots of minimal surfaces in S3, then this term vanishes, and then the Wilmore energy is just the area. So this was one of the reasons Blaschke was interested uh, in the subject. So he measures the area of minimal surfaces in the three sphere. And there's a very special minimal surface in the three sphere that's called the Clifford torus, which is just the product of two circles of radius 1 over square root of 2. So the radii are the same. And you have to choose them so that if the surface lies in, in the unit three sphere, so this torus is a minimal surface, and its area is easy to compute because this is just a product of circles. This area turns out to be 2 pi square. But that's not a coincidence because you can see that if you choose your stereographic projection correctly, the stereographic projection of the Clifford torus turns out to be that torus of revolution that I was talking about. So the, the projection is just, uh, well, this, this guy is the stereographic projection of the Clifford torus. So why 2 pi square? Well, 2 pi square is a natural number because it's the area of the Clifford torus. Okay? So this sort of suggests that there should be a relation of this problem with the theory of minimal surfaces, and, and we managed to make it uh, uh, precise, this, this, this connection. So let me uh, talk about partial results. So the problem has a long history. Uh, in the early 70s, Wilmer and independently Shiohama and Takaji, they proved the conjecture for tubes. So if you take a curve in three space and you consider uh, its tubular neighborhood of, of radius r around some space curve, then the conjecture is true in that case. Uh, in 76, Langevin and Rosenberg, uh, they managed to prove that if the torus is knotted, in other words, if it cannot be uh, deformed by ambient isotopies to the standard torus, uh, then the Wilmer energy should be at least 8 pi, which is better, the, better than 2 pi square. For example, in this picture, this torus seems to be knotted, I guess. All right. So if the surface is not embedded, in other words, if it has at least one self-intersection, then uh, Li and Yao in 1982 check that the Wilmer Wilmer energy should be at least 8 pi again. So this is similar to Wilmer res Wilmer's original result in spirit. So Wilmer had proved that any surf the Wilmer energy of any surface should be at least 4 pi, right? 
So if, it, if the surface happens to have one self-intersection, the energy should be at least a pi. If it has a triple intersection, 12 pi, and, and, and so on. So it's, it's part of a general, general result. So in other words, if you want to prove the conjecture, you can assume without laws of generality that the surface is embedded, has no self-intersections. So in that same paper, uh, they were able to verify the conjecture uh, under some assumptions on the conformal class, right? In particular for the conformal class of the Clifford torus. In 83, uh, Chen uh, proved it for flat tori in the three sphere. Here's a picture. So the pictures are, are not mine, they're all taken from the web. The conjecture is also known for tori of revolution. Now the torus doesn't have to be circular, of course. This was proved by Langer and Singer. 1984. <clears throat> 86, Montiel and Ross improved the previous result of Li and Yao, so they enlarged the set of conformal classes. Uh, and also, this is kind of, kind of interesting. We knew about that after we finished writing the paper. So these guys, Benzimon and Moots, in 91, they sort of checked the conjecture experimentally by looking at some uh, toroidal vesicles and under the microscope, so somehow the Clifford torus was the uh, equilibrium configuration. All right, and, uh, as Harold also said, Leon Simon 93 proved that there was a minimizer, so we already knew that there was one particular torus better than the others. Uh, and finally, in 99, Antonio Ross and, and later 2000, Peter Topping, they check the conjecture uh, for the antipodal symmetric case. So if your surface here in the three sphere is invariant under antipodal, under the antipodal map, then the conjecture was known, known to be true. The methods are, are completely different from those two papers. Our method is sort of ins initially inspired by, by, the, by the paper of, of Ross. Uh, right, but uh, as, also, as Harold also says, so, uh, there was a lot of mathematics, uh, not you know, in the direction of the conjecture, but around, around the problem. So Robert Bryant in 84 classified the Wilmer spheres. So uh, you, you don't have to look at minimizers. You can consider critical points, for example, and there are lots of them, for example, at the surface is a sphere. They're all, they're all, they all have self-intersections. And in 85, Pinko also found many uh, uh, beautiful uh, examples of tori, which are critical point embedded, infinitely many of them actually, uh, but none of them, of course, are minimizers. Okay, so at this point, uh, let, me, let me give the statements. So in our paper, we prove two theorems. So theorem A, joint paper with Nevis, uh, says that uh, suppose you have a surface in the three sphere, embedded, closed, and suppose its genus is at least one. Then we prove that the Wilmer energy should be bounded below by two pi square, and the equality holds if and all your surface is conformal to the, to the Clifford torus. So of course, theorem A implies that the Wilmer conjecture is true, but uh, we managed to prove the two pi square bound also for higher genus surfaces, and also get the rigidity we did its statement. So, so that's the main result of the paper. Uh, but as I said, uh, we, we use the theory of minimal surfaces. So we first prove a result about minimal surfaces in the three sphere, which are very interesting for, for geometry. So this certainly has independent interest, although it seems kind of like a corollary of theorem A. So theorem B says, suppose you have a surface in the three sphere, again, embedded and closed, genus at least one, but now suppose it's a minimal surface. As I said, we know lots of examples. We proved then that the area uh, of, of such minimal surface should be bounded below by 2 pi square. And the quality uh, holds if and only if the surface is the Clifford torus now up to, up to isometries. So somehow it looks like a corollary because we, we saw that the Wilmore energy of a minimal surface is just its area, right? But it's important to prove theorem B first because we use really, uh, the, we use really the theory of, of minimal surfaces. So theorem B is basically saying that if you want to classify, uh, if you want to make a list of minimal surfaces in the three sphere 
uh, by the area, ordered by the area, right? The, the, it was known that the first surface in the list is the, is the equator, the great sphere with area 4 pi. So this theorem says that the next surface in the list is the Clifford torus with area 2 pi square. All right, so we're going to use Mimax idea. So let me explain with a very simple example. You just recall uh, in what sense I, I, I'm going to uh, do Mimax. So suppose that you have, let's say, a finite dimensional surface shaped like that, for example, and you want to find its critical points. So of the height function, for example, in this picture, so it's very easy to find the minimum point, right? In this, in this picture, the C naught. Uh, but it's slightly more difficult to, uh, to, to detect uh, higher index critical points. So in this picture, the C1 has index 1, right? There's one direction which decreases, decreases area. So in order to find C1, you do Mimax. So what you do is that you fix some loop uh, going into the hole, like, like the black loop in the picture. Uh, then for each such loop, you take the maximum, the maximum height. So you look at all loops which are homotopic to a fixed one going into the hole. Uh, you look at the highest possible uh, value of the height function. Then you minimize over all such, such loops. And by doing so, uh, you end up finding uh, C1, the critical point of index 1. So first you take the supremum of the height functions over a loop. Then you minimize in the homotop class. So one important observation here is that in this picture, this critical point has index 1, and we are able to find it using one-parameter families. So in general, Moore's theory tells us that if we uh, want to find a critical point of index k, for example, we need to do Mimax over families with at least k parameters. So it's more difficult to, to detect higher index critical points because you have to consider higher dimensional families. This is an important observation because the Clifford torus is a minimum of surface, so it's a critical point of the area functional. And as a critical point, the Clifford torus has index 5, whereas the equator has index 1. All right, so let me uh, say a few words about minimal surfaces. So minimal surfaces, those surfaces with zero mean curvature, the critical points for the area functional, right? So in this picture, you, can, you could think that this uh, sort of represents the space of all surfaces, and then you replace the height function by the area functional. Uh, then the equator, the great sphere, is a minimal surface with index 1, as I said. You can uh, push it up, so there's one direction that decreases its area. And in fact, the, the, it was known that the equator can be produced by doing Mimax consider uh, one-parameter families of surfaces. So what you do is you have your three-sphere. So this denotes the, uh, the three-sphere. So you consider, for example, uh, one-parameter families of, of surfaces that sweep out your three-sphere, like in the picture. Those are the, the red curves going from the south to the north pole. And for each such family, you, you look at the largest value of the area, the largest area surface in the family. Then you minimize this number over all such families, over all sweep outs of S3. And by doing that, uh, you end up finding the, the equator, minimal surface with area 4 pi. In fact, uh, every Riemannian 3 manifold compact contains a minimal surface which is constructed in that way. And that was the motivation, one of the motivations of doing Mimax for the, for the area functional to produce examples of minimal surfaces. So that's, so, okay, so we know the, how to produce the, the equator by Mimax. So we pose ourselves the following question. Can we produce the Clifford torus by Mimax methods? So that, that's, uh, in a sense, the question that guided us along uh, during this work. So let me tell you the ingredients. Uh, those are the facts that were known in the literature. So the first ingredient says the following. So for each fixed surface in the three sphere, so you think of a surface as a point in the space of all surfaces. So for each uh, fixed surface in the three sphere, there's a canonical family of surfaces, which is five dimensional. This is parameterized by V and T, where V is a vector in the ball, and T is a parameter, which goes from minus pi to pi. 
So there's a five-dimensional family passing through your surface with the property that the area of each surface in the family is bounded above by the Wilmot energy. Right? And you can define those surfaces explicitly. Uh, I say here Heinz Karka. Actually, Heinz Karka is much more general than this. This follows essentially as a, uh, as a very special case. And we learned of this area estimate by reading that paper of Antonio Rosin in 1999. So that's very suggestive, right? Because we see that there are five parameters involved. So the second element uh, or ingredient in the proof is that we have a characterization of the Clifford torus by its index. So if you consider a minimal surface in the three sphere with any genus, so it's important that this result holds for any genus, and suppose that the index is at most five, then uh, the surface has to be either the Clifford torus, which has index five, or the great sphere with index one. That, that's a theorem of Urbano in 1990. So it's a characterization of the Clifford torus uh, by, by, by the index. So you see that there is an interesting coincidence here, the index and the dimension of the family. Uh, and finally, we needed uh, a theory, MIMAX theory, that applies for minimal surfaces. So we were lucky that such theory is available in the literature. This started with Almgren in the 60s, and it was finished by Pitts in 1981, and this uses a lot of geometric measure theory, which I'm not going to uh, get into uh, today, but it but turns out that there is such a, such a theory. So at this point, let me uh, explain uh, what was the program, what we had in mind in the beginning of the, the project, right? So we, want, we have this surface for which we want to, uh, to prove the Wilmer conjecture, the surface in the three sphere, and then we knew that there was this five-dimensional family canonically constructed uh, with the property that the area of each surface in the family is below the Wilmore energy of the original guy. So we thought, okay, so uh, this reminds us of MIMAX, right? So you can consider now all families which are homotopic to that fixed one and do MIMAX over such, such a class. So for each such five-dimensional family, homotopic to that canonical one, you take the largest possible area and then you try to minimize it we thought, okay, maybe if we're lucky, we're going to be able to produce a minimal surface out of that. And uh, because of most theory, we sort of thought that we maybe would be able to prove that since this family is five-dimensional, we would be able to prove that the index of this minimal surface is bounded by five. So we knew that such a surface had to be the Clifford torus or the great sphere. And then we thought, okay, maybe if we're lucky, uh, we'll be able to find some new topological idea which will allow us to rule out the, the case of a great sphere. So by doing so, we, we end up proving that the MIMAX surface is the Clifford torus which has, that has area two pi square. And then we prove that the Wilmer energy of the original guy, of course, has to be above the area of the Clifford torus. So that was sort of like the rough, rough idea that we had in the beginning. All right, so uh, here I just wanted to set up some notation. So for MIMAX theory, so we're talking about families which are parameterized by the n-dimensional cube, right? And that take values in the space of closed surfaces in our given manifold. So to be precise here, we have to work with integral currents in the language of, of geometric measure theory. Uh, but let us just, for the purposes of this talk, think that for each point in the cube, we are associating some closed surface uh, in the manifold. So we fix one such family. Then you consi we consider the homotope class of such family with a fixed boundary value, so relative to the boundary. And then we do Mimax. So for each uh, family in the homotope class, we take the soup of the areas of those surfaces, and then we, we minimize we minimize this number over all such families. And that's called the width, the width of the homotope class. So intuitively, the width is the, the least amount of area that one needs to sweep out uh, your manifold. Well, at least considering this homotope class. And then there is a MIMAX theorem, which as I said, this was proven by Elmgren and Pitts, which basically says that you can achieve this number as the area of some minimal surface. Maybe disconnected and maybe with some multiplicities. But anyway, uh, one can in fact find minimal surfaces by, by doing 
that process. Okay, so that's what I had to say very briefly about the MIMEX theory. Let me now describe the canonical, the canonical family. So as I said, uh, for each, uh, if you think of a, a surface as a point in the space of surfaces, uh, for each such point, there is a five-dimensional guy, sigma vt, with the property that the area of each surface here is bounded above by the Wilma energy. And this surfaces can be constructed very explicitly. Very, uh, it's, it's, it's simple. Uh, so first one considers uh, conformal transformations. So, uh, you know, you're talking about S3, so you can consider a center dilation. So S3 has a lot of conformal transformations. So if you, if you pick an axis, you do stereographic projection, you can consider dilations centered at that axis. So those are conformal transformations which basically send everything uh, to the south pole. And, and, and such conformal transformations can be parameterized by a vector v in the uniball. That's the explicit formula. So for each vector v in the B4, we have a center dilation. And then we apply, we apply those conformal diffeomorphisms to our original surface. So by doing that, we get some four-dimensional family of surfaces. But we need a fifth parameter, right? Because otherwise, we won't be able to capture the Clifford torus. So the fifth parameter comes from looking at equidistant surfaces. So first, you apply conformal transformations. You get a four-dimensional guy. And for each such surface in this four-dimensional family, you look at its equidistant surfaces. So by doing that, the topology can change. So you have to work in, in really uh, in some general setting, like the setting of in, in currents. So you, you construct this family very explicitly. Uh, so this family is parametrized by a vector v in the unipole and a parameter t, which goes from minus pi to pi, which is the distance to the surface. But now, in order to do Mimax theory, one has to extend this family to the closure of the unipole. And here, there is a problem, because apparently there is a lack of continuity, which can be explained very simply by considering the following situation. So suppose that you have a surface in three space, and you start dilating your surface to infinity uh, uh, with respect to the origin, there are two different types of behavior, right? So if a surface does not pass through the origin, then the, the surface vanishes at infinity. But if your surface happens to pass through the origin, then as you take this, the sequence of dilations, so the genus disappears at infinity, and in the limit, what you see is a plane. So it's essentially what's happening here, but since we are working in the three sphere instead, we get either a point as a limit or a great sphere. So there's a parent, parent, apparently a problem of continuity, but we, were, we, we managed to solve that by doing a reparameterization. So that was one of the first difficulties. And in doing so, you, know, you no longer see only points and great spheres. Now you see uh, round spheres of different centers and different radii in the boundary and varying continuously. So that was a very important point. So the parameter space is a ball, four-dimensional ball, uh, across an interval going from minus pi uh, to, to pi. And for each point in such a cylinder, we associate the surface in a canonical way uh, in such a way now that the boundary is mapped onto the space of round spheres, right? Because we already did this extension. And even though we started with genus, in the boundary, we only see round spheres uh, varying continuously. So if you fix a vector here in the boundary of the ball, and you look at this one parameter family of surfaces or, or round spheres, so these surfaces are actually, they, they, they form um, a foliation uh, of round spheres centered at the same point in S3, which I denote by, by Q. So for each vector in the three sphere, you see, you see round spheres centered at some point given by the center map, Q. And here's the main topological uh, fact that we discovered. So we discovered that the center map, which now goes from S3 to S3, we discovered that its topological degree is equal to the genus of the original guy. So this is saying that the, the information about the genus of the original surface can be captured uh, through uh, the degree of the center map 
in the canonical family. So we were quite excited when we, we, we discovered that. Because, as I said, one important point is to rule out the possibility of getting great spheres. In other words, we have to somehow use the information about the genus. All right, so this is saying that the boundary is mapped onto the space of round spheres in a homotopically non-trivial way if the genus is at least one. So that also explain, explains why we, 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 we don't care if it's a torus or a surface of genus 2, right? Because the only important thing is that this number is different from 0. OK. Right. So that was a very important point. So let me just summarize the family that we just constructed. So we, con we just constructed a family uh, parameterized by the cylinder, but the cylinder is homeomorphic to a 5 cube. Uh, for each point in the 5 cube, you associate a surface in S3. So this family is continuous in the sense of currents. Uh, in the bottom and at the top of the cube, you, you see the trivial surface, because remember that the vertical deformation corresponds to equidistant surfaces. So there's nothing at distance pi or minus pi uh, at the 3 sphere. So the bottom and the top are sent into the trivial surface. But now if you look at the, at the boundary, at the you know, at the other faces of the cube, then we see round spheres. So if you fix a point in the boundary of the full cube, uh, so let me make a picture here. So if you fix a point, maybe I should draw like that. This is I4, this is I. So here we see basically the trivial surface here the same. But now if you pick a point in the boundary of the full ball, what you see here is a family, some family of round spheres centered at some point, which of course depends on, depends on x. So that's the center map, which now goes from, from the boundary of the cube to the three sphere. So as I said, the important point is that if the genus of the original surface is at least one, then the center map has non-trivial degree. Right? And we also know that the area is bounded by the Wilmot energy. So let me give you an outline of the proof. So this is a rough outline. So start with a surface in the three sphere with genus at least one, for which we want to prove the Wilmot conjecture. All right. So then we have this canonical family passing through that guy. And then we can apply MIMAX theory to all families which are homotopic to the canonical one. In doing so, using elmgren pitts MIMAX theory, we find a critical point for the area functional. In other words, we find a minimal surface, sigma hat, produced by MIMAX methods, with the property that the area of the minimal surface is bounded above by the Wilmer energy, because we, already, we started from, from, that, from that bound. So in some sense, if I want to, if I want to try to make a picture of the space of surfaces, of course, somehow here we have the trivial surfaces with area, area zero, right? Then we know that the least area minimal surface is the equator. Uh, maybe this is the equator uh, with area four pi, which can produce by it has index one, so this is one dimensional. So somehow we're, we're, we are, what we want to do is to detect the Clifford torus here. In the, some, somewhere in the picture with index, index five. All right, so, so we start with the surface. You apply Mimax theory to, to the homotope class of the family. You find some minimal surface, different, different surface but the area is below the, the Wilmore energy of the original guy. So then you have to prove that the surface that you, you constructed cannot be a great sphere. And that must be through a topological argument. That's at least how, how we do it. So in other words, uh, we prove that the surface has genus at least one. And this uses a result of Elmgren, which says that the equator is the only surface, minimal surface of genus zero. So the important point here is that when we run the MIMEX process, we were able to prove that if we start with a surface with genus at least one, we end up with a surface 
of genus at least one. That's the important point of the construction. So now, remember that first we have to prove a statement about the area of minimal surfaces. That was theorem B. So what you do is that uh, you forget about the equator, then you look, up, you look at all uh, the other minimal surfaces. It follows by standard arguments in geometric measure theory that there, that there is one minimal surface which has least area among all non-spherical ones. So here I denote it by sigma 1. That's the minimal surface of least area among all such with non-trivial genus. And then the idea is that uh, Mimex theory will tell us that the index of this minimal surface has to be bounded by 5. Because the idea is that if the index was bigger, let's say 6, for example, we had this five-dimensional family. So if the index was at least 6, we would be able to perturb such family and the area would go down. And then you would produce a minimal surface with even less area, which is a contradiction because we picked the guy with least area among all such. So if you run the process again, but now with the sigma 1, we conclude that the index of sigma 1 has to be uh, at most 5. And then we use Urbano's theorem. Sigma 1 has to be the Clifford torus, right? Because we already know that it's not a great sphere. So that proves theorem B. So the, the least area minimal surface after the equator is the Clifford torus. And finally, uh, to prove theorem A and the Wilmer conjecture, we just run this process again, one, two, four. So we start with a surface with genus at least one. We do Mimax. We produce this minimal surface whose area is below the Wilmer energy. But now, because of the topological argument, we know that the genus of that guy is at least one. So its area has to be bigger than the area of the sigma one. But we just proved the sigma one was the Clifford torus, right? So this area is two pi square. So this proves theorem A and the, and, and the Wilmer conjecture. All right. Right, so that, 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 that's an outline. So let me explain uh, in a few words uh, just the topological argument. So how do we rule out great spheres? Since I have maybe five minutes. Uh, so the idea is that, so we have this four-dimensional family, homotop class of four-dimensional families, right, defined in I4 uh, times I. And we want to prove that the mean max surface uh, is not a great sphere. So the way we do that is by proving that the width, which is the, the mean max invariant, is bigger than 4 pi. Right. So that tells us that the minimal surface that achieves it cannot be uh, an equator. So in the boundary, we see equators here at, at height 1 half. I didn't say that, but it was written there. So these guys are round spheres in the boundary, right, at, at level one half. But we want, to, we want to prove that somehow these families cannot degenerate uh, and, and the area cannot go to, the maximum area cannot go to four pi. So to illustrate the idea, we, we, let's just suppose for simplicity that we were able to construct some optimal family to the space of surfaces with the property that the soup of the areas is already 4 pi, let's say. The proof is by contradiction. You assume that there is an optimal guy, and then try to see uh, what kind of argument would work. Maybe let me illustrate this here. So the proof is by contradiction. Suppose there is an optimal guy with area 4 pi. Here's the parameter space. Then the, the, the idea is the following. Uh, let's see. The idea is the following. If you consider any vertical path going from the bottom to the top, so for each point here in this vertical path, we have associated a surface, and that surface is going from, from, a, from a point to a point in a non-trivial way. That was one, one main property of such family. So in, in other words, any such one parameter uh, family of surfaces in S3 is a non-trivial non sweep out. So we knew from the Mimax theory for one-dimensional families that at some point the area must be above 4 pi, right? Because the 4 pi, uh, the, the great sphere is the solution for the one-dimensional Mimax problem. So if, since I'm assuming that the soup of the areas is 4 pi, 
that is telling me that at some point this path must cross a great sphere. So for any vertical path going from the bottom to the top, at some point we see a great sphere here. So we can use that to construct a four-dimensional submanifold which separates the bottom from the top, uh, whose boundary is the one-half level, and with the property that each surface here in this four-dimensional guy is, a, is an equator, uh, is, a, is a great sphere of area 4 pi. And then the idea is that, all right, so, so for each equator, right, oriented, you can associate its center. So we can think about this surface as a point in S3. Just think of the center. And then we just remember what the information that we had on the boundary. So the final contradiction comes from homology. So the idea is that if, if you want to look at the image of such submanifold on the space of great spheres, right, you can compute this, this cycle uh, in two different ways. So first, remember that you had the information about the degree at the boundary. So this tells us that the cycle is g times the fundamental cycle of S3. But on the other hand, I just proved that this guy is the boundary of something. So I can compute it in a different way. So this is the same as the image of the boundary of the submanifold. But now I can uh, pass, I can put the map inside because the map is taking values onto the space of great spheres. So what I'm proving in the end is that G times the S3 is the boundary of something. In other words, it's a trivial cycle. So this is a contradiction if the, if the genus is at least one. So of course, this is just a, a simplified argument. We do it, we do it very precisely with, with singular homology in the paper. But that's the idea. All right, maybe just to finish, I'll, I'll just mention that with similar ideas, we have been able to solve a problem in topology about links. I'll just be very quick. So we considered a link uh, in R3, so we have the this invariant, which is called the linking number. And it turns out that there is an energy for such links, which is given by this expression. That, that is called the Mabius cross energy. Uh, and that quantity is also conformally invariant. It's also conformally invariant. So you, you can ask the question, what is the best non-trivial link in R3 in the sense, what is the link that minimizes the Mabius energy? So in 94, Friedman, Hayden, Wang, conjecture, again, that the energy should be at least 2 pi square if the link is non-trivial. And in a joint paper with Ian Eagle and Andre Neves, uh, we managed to prove that this conjecture is true. So the energy should be at least 2 pi square, and that number is achieved precisely by, by the standard Hopf link and its conformal images. So it's a very simple link here. So the interesting thing is that, again, this is a problem in topology, but somehow it's related uh, to the theory of minimal surfaces. The idea here is that if you look at the, for those who know, the Gauss map of the link, of the standard Hopf link that parametrizes the Clifford torus. So that's a relation with the theory of surfaces. So if you ask, if you go back to the question, well, what is the best uh, link in R3? So you have to do a stereographic projection uh, uh, to the standard Hopf link, well, the most symmetric one is to do stereographic projection with respect to a point in one of those curves. So the picture that you get is a, is a straight line and a circle centered, centered at that line. All right, I should stop here. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>